That's the title of my sermon tonight. Three factors affecting your fight. Three factors affecting your fight. I don't really have much in the way of announcements, so I'll just go straight into it. So I'm going to go over today three factors affecting your fight. That's the title of the sermon. So let's just read first in Deuteronomy 20, uh, where there's this, there's this interesting passage here where the children of Israel, before they go into battle, this is sort of uh, what they were told to do, uh, especially when they saw an army that was greater and, and more in number than they were. So just I'll read here these nine verses, quite interesting. It says here in Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So that's sometimes, you know, like us in the spiritual war, right? That's the application. Obviously, there's a lot of stories in the Old Testament about wars and stories that happen because they're examples and things that we can take from there to apply in the war we find ourselves in, which is the spiritual war today. And, and we are generally on the minority side, aren't we? On, on, the less, on the side that has less people. We look at the enemy and there is always more than thou. Um, and it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people. So you can see when they're, when they're actually on coming to the battlefield, right? Then the priest shall come up and they'll speak unto the people. And this is what they'll say. And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, and do not tremble, neither be ye terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And the officers, so now that's what the priests would say to everybody, right? And now the officers, right, which is, are amongst the people, they'll speak unto the people saying, What man is there that hath built a new house and hath not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard? And hath, not eaten, and hath not yet eaten of it. Let him also go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. So there you see the first factor. And, when, and what man is there that hath betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted, let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint, as well as his heart. And it shall be when the officers has ma have made an end of speaking unto the people, that they shall make captains of the armies to lead the people. So an interesting scenario there, right? You go to war, and there are three things where they say, you know, if you've bought a house and you haven't dedicated it, if you've planted a vineyard, if you've just taken a wife, you've betrothed a wife, but you haven't taken, uh, you've betrothed a wife, but you haven't yet taken her and even if you're fearful or faint-hearted basically they're saying you know you can you can return home right and then after they return home then they appoint captains over the armies and then they go to war so first thing i would just want to talk about is you know we are at war and i sort of talked about that in the beginning that we are in a spiritual war aren't we um, let's read in ephesians 6 it says here finally my brethren be strong in the lord and in the power of his might Put on the whole armour of God. So you don't put on armour when you're not going to go fight, right? Like you put on armour because you're about to go fight a war to stand against what you're about to go against. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, so you can see there I've underlined but because there is a fight going on, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not like the Muslims, right? Where we actually take up arms and do, I don't know what they call it, jihad and actually take over a physical nation and, and you know, amass, uh, you know, Humvees and amass, uh, you know, uh, rifles and whatnot and actually go to war. That's not the war we're in. We're in a spiritual war. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, so that means we do actually wrestle. It's just not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So ours is a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle against principalities, against the powers and authorities of this world. And, and, we, and we will go on soon how we actually are to arm ourselves and how we fight. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. 
So we ought to be doing our all, right? It's not, it's not that we go to battle and we just go half-hearted, we just take it easy, we just coast. No, when there's a battle, when there's a war going on, you're meant to be doing all you can. So that's one thing to think about. Are you doing everything you can or are you just coasting in your Christian life? Are you just taking it easy? Are you just like stopping to smell the roses, not realizing that there's a war going on? Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. I'll just give you a couple of thoughts on each one of these things just because it's, it's quite interesting how this armor sort of hangs together. So when I see stand therefore having your loins, right, which is your area here, girt about with truth, if you think about that, that's kind of like a belt that you put on, right? You know, we put on our pants and we put a belt on to keep our pants up. So when I think about the loins girt about with truth, it's sort of like your pants cover your nakedness, right? And what's naked? The nakedness is associated with shame. So what I see that is if you don't have the truth, it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of shameful to you. If somebody's, you know, standing up, defending something, you know, like if somebody has another false religion, it's sort of shameful for them because what happens is they stand up and they try and be so zealous about that, but they don't even have the truth, you know? So that's how I think it's kind of, it's kind of linked in. And I'm not, obviously, I might not be 100% right on all these. These are just the thoughts I have. So your loins get about with truth. I see that as something that's actually holding your pants up, holding these up so that you're not uh, naked. You don't have that shame. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, why is righteousness uh, analogous to a breastplate here. So the way I see it is when you have a breastplate, which is sort of covering the armor here, it protects your heart, doesn't it? So when you live righteous, when you walk in the spirit, your heart is not with the world. You know, your heart isn't in sin and it protects your heart. Then it says here in verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what is the symbolism here? When your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, when you take the gospel, you put shoes on because you're ready to move, aren't you? That's why the Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Because the preparation of the gospel of peace is something that should be on the move, where we actually go to the people. We're not waiting for them to come here. It doesn't say your seat shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, where a lot of churches do that, where they just expect, they just start a church and they just have their preaching every week, trying to preach the gospel to, to believers in the congregation, just hoping unbelievers will just grace us with their presence here. No, we don't shod our seat with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We shod our feet with with the preparation of the gospel of peace, because we're meant to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Now, why is the shield symbolized as our faith? Because sometimes you don't always understand everything, right? You don't always know all the answers. And sometimes your faith will come under scrutiny. And at that time, you may not know all the answers, but faith is you believe the word of God anyway, even though you may not have all the answers at that point. And then you can go and seek the answer. So it's a shield to you because it keeps you moving forward. It makes you not stop even though you don't know all the answers. That's why somebody that doesn't have the shield of faith, they're not strong in their faith, they might go soul winning, they might come under a bit of persecution, they might, you know, people might, you know, uh, you know say, oh, you know, you believe this stupid religion or you're an idiot or whatnot, and then they stop trying to share their faith. But somebody that has the shield of faith, they might not know the answers, but that doesn't mean they stop moving forward. They go and find the answers because they believe God's word is true. They know the answers are there. They just don't know maybe the, they just don't have the understanding yet. Wherewith ye shall be able to quench or the fiery darts of the wicked. So you see here, this is where you don't always know where these things come from, but the shield of faith protects you. Um, if you think about these arrows in a war. And take the helmet of salvation. So why is salvation a helmet? I think it's because when you get saved, then now you get the understanding. Like through faith, we understand. It, God gives us a sound mind. Now that we believe his word and we are saved, we have the Holy Spirit that helps us to understand and perceive the things of the Spirit of God. And that's why I believe salvation is characterized as protecting your head. Um, and here we get now on. Now up to this point, Every piece of the armor of God is a defensive piece, isn't it? Right? You had the, the, the boots, you think you had, you had the belt, you had the breastplate, you had the boots, and then you've got the shield, and then the helmet, and now we start to see the offensive things in the armor of God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now you remember, we fight a spiritual war. What is a spiritual war? A spiritual war is a war of words, isn't it? It's a war of the mind. That's why, you know, we have the word of God because God's word, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's why it's this sword of the spirit. It's the word of God. That's what we preach. 
That's why it says praying always with all prayer and supplication. Sorry, this is another thing. So we've got the sword of the spirit, which is our offensive weapon. Our second offensive thing is prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all saints. So we pray, we ask for God's power, we ask for God to help us, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ so that they would not faint in the war. And we're watching. What is watching? Watching means that you're actually awake, you're actually aware of what's going on. You're not just taken away with the cares of this world and, and distracted with all the things you have to do day by day. You don't let that get you away from the spiritual battle that you're in. You are watching. You are aware that the reason why you are here is to be a soldier, to fight in this battle. Thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. See, so you're not just having selfish prayers, right? Where you're always just praying just about yourself, just the things that you want God to bless you with, just the things that you need. No, you're also praying with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, right? You should know what your brothers and sisters in Christ, what they want things prayed for, and you ought to be praying and thinking about those things too because your prayers will make a difference in their life. This is why we have to be familiar with our prayer request list. You know, I'm going to start posting that on Facebook for you guys so you guys know, hey, keep it up to date. If there are things on there that are out of date, there are things on there you want to add, hey, we want to be keeping this commandment, right? We want to be praying for each other with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Look at this. And for me, so just stressing this point that we are in a spiritual battle of words. And for me, this is what Paul wants people to pray for him for, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. See, that is the war. The war is for you to open your mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And if you do not open your mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, then that's already half the battle won, right? Because you're not actually fighting. Or if all you're doing is defending, how do you win a battle when you're only defending? I mean, think about it. I don't know, maybe a lot of you guys watch MMA, right? MMA is, uh, you know, very popular. Now, just think, if, if they fought and all they did was defended, how would they win that fight? How do they knock them out? How do they submit them, right? They have to go on the offense eventually to win that battle. And if we just keep our mouths shut, but we have faith and we just, you know, we're just going to stand here till, till Jesus comes, that sort of mentality, then we will ne never win any battle out there. If we want to win a battle, we need to open our mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. Now, the reason why I underlined ambassador, I just wanted to give you this thought, to remind us that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You know, what does that mean? An ambassador is when you represent somebody else. Now, how do you think you're doing representing Jesus in your life? When people see the way you uh, present yourself, the way you talk, the things you write on social media, the things you post on social media, are you a good ambassador for Jesus Christ? Do they look at that and think, wow, this person is representing Jesus Christ, and when they look at you, they think highly of Jesus Christ? Or do they think, well, what sort of ambassador is this? Right? We are all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. If we are born again believers, we represent Jesus Christ to the world. So what sort of image are you projecting to the world? Just have a think about that. You know, how do you represent yourself? Because you are representing Jesus Christ as a born-again, saved believer. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So you see here that this, this battle, this war that we are in, is a war of words, right? And it's a war, it's a spiritual war. It's not a physical battle. It's about our testimony. It's about what we say. It's about how we present ourselves. Now, there's three types of Christians. Oh, I forgot to actually pull up my notes. Yeah, Three types of Christians I just wanted to let you know about. And, and I'm sure I, I, I didn't make this up, so I'm not going to take credit. But, you know, that I'm sure they do it in all sorts of things like sales. I probably got it from a sales presentation sometime. But three types of people, three types of Christians. I just wanted to apply this to the, to the spiritual war. But one is those that are actually in the fight, right? There are the Christians that are actually in the fight, they're participating, they're in there, they actually are making a difference. They will be, they're the, that's where the rubber meets the pavement, right? They're the actual soldiers on the battlefield and, and the reason why any spiritual battle is being won, it's because of the Christians that are in the fight actually fighting. What's the second type of Christian? The second type of Christian is just the Christian that's watching the fight. Right? So they know there's a fight going on, but they're not involved. 
right? But they're aware that it's happening and they're just watching and they're maybe just cheering on the people that are in the fight, right? So they're, they're happy to pray for them and cheer for them, right? But they're not actually in it themselves, you know, opening their mouth boldly, making known the mystery of the gospel. And the third type of Christian is the Christian that doesn't even know there's a fight going on, right? They're, they're not watching. They're ignorant of what's happening. They're just in the world, doing their own thing, pleasing their own selves, serving themselves, living their life, living it up, and they don't even realize that there is a fight going on. And, you know, it's the second two type of Christians are the ones, are the reason why we are losing the fight, right? Because the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And there are very few Christians that are actually in the fight, but they're not the only people that are saved, right? There's a lot of saved people out there that are either just watching the fight or they're ignorant of the fight. And this is part of the reason why we are losing the fight, right? Because we have less people actually in the fight. Uh, now let's go on to the, the three factors I talked about affecting your fight that we saw in uh, Deuteronomy 20. So the first part I was just talking about that we are, we are in a war. It's a good reminder that we are in a war so that we're not complacent about how we live and what we do. Now, number one, this is interesting when I went through these, I could make them all start with F, so I did. So this is one of those three-point alliteration type of uh, sermons. So number one from Deuteronomy 20 is your finances, right? And we saw this in verse 5. And the officers shall speak unto the people, saying, What man is there that had built a new house? Right? So sometimes something that affects your fight affects how effective you are in this spiritual war that is going on is your finances, right? It might be a big investment that you've put a lot of money into and that's drawing your heart away. That's what you're focused on, that you're not watching and in this fight because you're just thinking about the wealth that you're amassing. It says, hath not dedicated, let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man dedicate it. And what man is he that hath planted a vineyard? So it might not be some large investment that you put in. It might be a business venture that you're starting. And sometimes that takes you away from the spiritual fight, doesn't it? Because you start a business. And I'm not saying any of these things are wrong. Don't get, me, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things are wrong. These are just three factors that we have to be aware of that can affect your fight. One is a huge investment. One could be an investment or a business that you're trying to start. Or it could be that you're investing a lot of time in your career where you that's all you're focused on. And it's almost become an idol where er your life revolves around these things that's what takes top priority and sadly god gets put to the side because of that of, because of that priority right because we only have so much time in the day and if you're committing 60 70 hours a week in your career in your business there's going to be very little left over for god and that's not yet eaten of it let him also go and return unto his house lest he die in the battle and another man eat of it now, this verse in uh, Mark 4, this is the parable of the sower, right? And we know the parable of the sower. There's the four scenarios where there's the seed by the wayside. There's the seed amongst uh, thorny ground. There's a seed amongst stony ground. And then there's the seed that fell on good ground. Now, the, the part of that parable I just wanted to focus on was the seed sown among the thorns, right? And then Jesus here in Mark 4 explains what those thorns are that causes a Christian to be unfruitful, right? Once they are saved, why are they not unfruitful? It says here, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and look at this, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Now notice, it's not, it's not that there's necessarily anything wrong with the, the world in the sense of like physical things, right? Physical things in this world. That's not what it's saying is wrong and it's the thorn, right? It's not saying that riches necessarily are wrong, right? Because there's nothing, there's no, there's no issue with having a lot of wealth, right? It depends on what you do with it. And there's nothing wrong with other things. So you see how the thorns are not just other things, riches and things in this world. What are the thorns? The thorns are the cares of this world. It's when you are, a care, if you think about it, it's like when you're constantly worried, you're constantly preoccupied with just thinking about physical things. Remember we talked about uh, last week, the things that are seen, right? Because the things that are not seen are eternal. Those are the things that should be preoccupying our mind, not the cares of this world, the things that are seen. 
And I'm not saying, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you don't take responsibility for the things of this world. It's just that when it becomes more so, you're preoccupied more so with the physical things than the spiritual things, that's a thorn in your life and that can choke the word. What does that mean? It means that you're hearing the word, you know what the Bible says, but because you're so preoccupied with the things of this world, you're no longer considering what the Bible says and that word in your life has no real effect, right? It doesn't change you, it doesn't drive you. It doesn't motivate you to want to get into the war that we find ourselves in. Cares of this world. Now notice it's not riches, right? Because there are, there are people in the Bible, like Abraham was really rich. Job was really rich, right? But what is it? It's the deceitfulness of riches. Because why can riches be deceitful? Because you think that you're just going to get all this wealth and that's going to make you happier. You're going to somehow just be more content. That's going to, you know, you're going to get to the end of that rainbow. There's going to be that pot of gold and you think that's going to be the end of it. That's why riches are deceitful because that's not the case. You know, and we don't have to be rich to know that. We already have an example in the Bible. We have King Solomon. King Solomon had all the wisdom. He had all the power. He had all the riches. And what was his conclusion? You know, that it was all vanity vexation of spirit now do you think you're wiser than solomon you know i mean that's why it's funny when god you know we talked about job last week right and we think you know uh, we think that um you know you know we're getting it so hard and whatnot we don't understand and then we get the example of job where job was the most righteous person you know we think we're doing nothing wrong and then you know um and then we come under suffering well it's the same with solomon right like solomon is this example in the bible where we think no no because no, if i had all the power and if i had all the riches and i had all the wisdom I would have handled it better than Solomon. It's like, who do you think you are? You know, that's why riches are deceitful because we like deceive ourselves into thinking, yeah, well, if I just had more, if I just had a little bit extra, if I was rich, now I would be able to handle it. Um, I, would, I would not think it's vanity, even though the most wise man in the world, King Solomon, he came to that conclusion. We think sometimes that we are wiser <laughs> than that. So the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things, right? Just this constant desire to want more entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful let's look at first timothy 6 but godliness with contentment is great gain now i just want to make this point that contentment means that you are happy right contentment doesn't mean that you have no desire at all because sometimes christians just think that oh to be content means i do not never desire anything obviously it's not wrong to want something right but we ought to be content Right? Content means, how do you test whether you're content? You might desire something, right? But you've you got to test, well, how do I know I'm content? Well, you're content, you, you test whether you're content or not when you don't get that thing, right? Like, let's say you wanted something and you don't get it, are you still happy? Or what happens if you have something and then you lose it? Are you still happy? See, that's the test of contentment. Contentment, are, are you happy when you are bound or you are based, right? When you have or when you don't have right contentment and i've often heard this preached this way is just like there's no desire for anything like you just don't want anything extra of course like it's not there's nothing wrong to want to strive for more to want i mean and we ought, there are some places where you ought to strive for more right you ought to work harder you ought to want to grow in righteousness you ought to want to have more impact in your life you ought not just be content with where you are you know you want to you want to better yourself but the question is are you happy about it? even if you don't get to where you want to go can you still praise the Lord? Can you still rejoice always, like the Bible says? And again, I say, rejoice. So godliness with contentment is great gain. And that's where it's like, it's interesting. It's like one of those paradoxical things, like when the Bible says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's kind of like, how, how do I gain when I'm, when I'm getting killed, when I'm dead? You know, whereas this is saying, hey, godliness with contentment, you are happy where you are, and yet that's great gain. Isn't that interesting? Content, godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and is certain we can carry nothing out so there's that whole vanity of if you just strive just to amass physical things what are you going to carry out you know do you not realize like learn this lesson now learn this lesson now that material possessions will not go with you to the next world and then you won't be deceived by them you know you won't be you won't have this deceitfulness of riches when you realize we brought nothing into this world and it is certain it is certain, there's no doubt about it, that we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So what's the Bible saying? And this is the same in Matthew 6, right? Where he just says, you know, when you have food and raiment, then you shouldn't have to worry about anything else. It's he's repeating that here, having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. That's the standard that the Bible gives, right? Like we, we, we put a bigger standard than that, don't we? 
for us to be happy. But the Bible's saying, no, as long as you have food and you have clothing, you ought to be happy. And you ought to be content. But they that will be rich, so this is not just somebody that is rich, it says they that will be rich, that's somebody that desires riches, right? He's got that deceitfulness of riches to want to strive for those things. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. So this is a warning here to people who are striving to be rich and have been deceived by riches. Why? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So I talked about that a bit in the last few sermons. But just another thought, when we think about the root of all evil, I mean, one thing is just the destruction of the home, the destruction of the Christian family, the destruction of people living for God, where men, they just go out, all they think about is riches, all they want to do is get rich, and then they neglect their spiritual life and then they think, well, they, they leave some great legacy of business, but what sort of spiritual legacy are they leaving behind? You know, what, have they, what, what values have they instilled into their children to the next generation and the generation after that? And sometimes that happens because of the love of money, right? Because they love money more than God. They love money to the point where this is why there's a lot of, this, this is why there's a lot of evil in the world too, because Christian principles are going out the door and a lot of people don't know what they believe. They don't know why they believe it anymore. Verse 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. And look at what he ends on here in verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. And that's what we're talking about today, right? The spiritual fight that we're in. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and professed a good profession before many witnesses. We are in a fight, right? We are in a fight. And if we are not content with the things that we have, if we are not happy, if we are constantly have the love of money and are seeking after that, we're not fighting a good fight. It's going to take us away from that fight. So these finances, like we talked about, that's one factor that's going to affect your fight. Look at this uh, verse in 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, we ought to all be a soldier in this fight. No man that warreth entangleth himself. Now think back to the parable of the thorns, right? Parable of the sower, the word, uh, uh, the, 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 the ones amongst the thorns getting choked. They're entangled amongst those thorns. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So that was the first factor affecting your fight, right? Number one was the finances. We saw that if they bought a house or if they planted a vineyard in Deuteronomy 20. Let's go into the second factor, right? The second factor is your family. And we saw that factor in verse 7. And it says, And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So another factor that can take us away, that can affect our fight. Excuse me is our family. Now in Deuteronomy 20, we see the, the example here is your spouse, right? So that is one thing that can affect your, affect your fight, right? Your spouse. What else? Your children, right? And it's when, it's when you end up serving your spouse or your children in place of God, right? It takes away uh, from your spiritual fight. But not only that, it can be the other way around as well, you know, where this, your spouse could be just not supportive. Like you could be a spouse that is affecting your spouse's spiritual fight. Right? So you not only don't want your spouse to affect your spiritual fight, you want to lead in that battle, but also you don't want to be a spouse that is affecting somebody's spiritual fight. You don't want to be a spouse that's always down on your husband or a spouse that's always down on your wife. You know, they're, they're studying the Bible. They're talking about the Bible. You don't want to quash that desire. You don't want to, you know, your husband's trying to do something great for God and you're just like, oh, you spend so much time at church. You spend, so, you know, just like a spouse that's just taking away the energy, the spiritual energy from her husband. And Life, vice versa, right? It could be a husband that is trying to discourage his wife from living for the Lord. So your spouse, children. What about parents? And then I've got relatives, right? Because really your family is just, you know, when you, when you get married, you start a new family. This is one thing in, in Christianity that a lot of cultures don't really realize. Like cultures just think, you know, your extended family and you know, extended relatives, right? Um, they just consider that as one big family, whereas the Bible doesn't. The Bible teaches that, you know, the husband, you know, the man leaves his father and mother, cleaves to his wife, right? And they join um, and they're now one flesh. So that's the start of a new family. 
that family then answers to God. You know, the husband answers to God. The husband doesn't answer to his mother-in-law. The husband doesn't answer to his, to his dad, right? The husband doesn't answer to like his great-great-grandfather who's still alive and he's like the head of this tribe. No, no, the husband answers to Jesus Christ because the husband is the head of the wife, he's the head of the family, and he is the head of that family, right? There is no, no one above the husband in that family. So spouse, children, parents, relatives. Let's go on to uh, Matthew 12, where we see here, and this is a very profound passage. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this passage. If you are familiar with the Bible, you would know this passage, but it's just something that we have to reflect on because we live in a world, we live in a day and age where people think very highly. They, can, they esteem their family very highly, and they should. I'm not saying the opposite then is to just like negate them completely, but Look at what happens here in Matthew 12. It says here in verse 46, While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Now, Jesus had a physical family when he was here. Obviously, when he was, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he had a, a physical mother, right, as, as an earthly, uh, uh, as a man. And he had half-brothers and sisters, right, because Joseph and Mary had other children, and, and they were like his half-brothers, right? Now, think about this. We ought to follow Jesus in everything, right? I mean, there's, no, there's, nothing, that, there's nothing that Jesus did where we, we think, well, you know, no, what, what was Jesus talking about, right? Like if we see Jesus do something or say something as a man and he's quoted as doing it in the scriptures, that ought to be something we take heed to. That's why when Jesus was baptized and he went up straight way out of the water and yet there's all these churches that sprinkle, you kind of think, you know, yeah, it's one thing if the apostles were, and it says they were baptized and came up straight way out of the water. But when Jesus Christ himself is baptized by immersion, I mean, that's something we should take notice of and not just think, well, you know what? I'm going to baptize by sprinkling, even though Jesus was baptized by immersion. I remember when I was in the Presbyterian church and they were talking about, you know, baptism by sprinkling, baptism by immersion. And, uh, you know, they used to talk, I don't think there is a scripture in the Bible that, that where somebody was baptized by sprinkling, but they were saying, oh, you know, there's all these different examples because they say, oh, it doesn't really matter whether you use uh, more water or less water, it doesn't really make a difference. That was their argument, right, to try and sprinkle. And then he was saying, like, well, we have all these different examples of people getting sprinkled, and then all the examples of people getting sprinkled were like church fathers, like, you know, Methodist church, these people. And then he goes over people that were baptized by immersion, and one of his examples was Jesus Christ. Right? We see, and he even acknowledges that in, in the Bible we see Jesus Christ was baptized, baptized by immersion. And I'm just thinking, well, if Jesus Christ is in your group of examples and his example is that he was baptized by immersion, then who cares to all the ex other, other examples? I'm following Jesus. Um, so same with here. You know, we have Jesus here. He's, he's talking to the people. His family is outside and they tell him, then one said unto him, verse 47, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. So sometimes our family, right, can affect our fight. Sometimes your family wants you to do things to get you away, get you away from church, get you away from soul winning, whether it's just discouraging you or making fun of you or, you know, having events always on Sunday. You know, all their family events just happen to be when church is on. Because your family, it's like they just desire to see you. They desire to speak with you and they want to get you away from the will of God. Look at Jesus's, look at Jesus's response to when he was doing the will of God, he was at church, he was preaching, his family wanted him to, to go and speak with them. Look at his response in verse 48. But he answered and said unto him that told him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? So what is he saying here? He's like, is he, he's not even recognizing at that point when he's amongst God's people, he's doing God's work, it's almost like he doesn't even, it doesn't even recognize that they are his family anymore because they're saying, hey, your family's out here and they want to see you, they want to speak with you. And he's like, who is, who is my family? Right? Are they my family? It's almost like that, that, that you're sort of seeing here. Verse 49, he stretched forth his hands towards his disciples, towards the church of God, towards the body of Christ, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. That's a, very, that's a very profound statement, especially in the cultures that we live in. You know, the cultures, you probably that even, even in my culture, where we, we, it's just, you just, it's just drilled into you that family comes first. Family is what's most important. That's not what Jesus said. You know, when Jesus said, hey, my thy brother and thy, thy, my mother and thy brethren want to desire to speak with you, he's like, who are they? Who is my mother and my brethren? And he stretched forth his hands to his disciples and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. Now, that's, this is not an easy thing to do, but this is what we should be striving for in this church, where we see each other as family. 
We treat each other as family. We pray about each other as family. We help each other as family because the way God sees it, this is your true family, even though you don't see it that way yet. This is how Jesus sees it. Towards his disciples, behold, my mother and my brother, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. 1 Corinthians 7. He says here, but I would have you without carefulness. So we're talking about things that take, take you away from uh, you know, factors that affect your fight. I just wanted to show you this verse to see how your spouse can be a factor that takes you away from that. But I would have you without carefulness that he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord that he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. So there is a danger, obviously, in marriage that you end up serving your wife more than you serve the Lord. It takes you away from the service of the Lord, right? So this is something that we have to be aware of. But as a spouse, this is something that you can help as well, right? Because if there's a natural tendency for a spouse to want to serve their spouse, as we see in the Bible, why don't you be a spouse that points your spouse back to God? And then it's kind of like, I can undo that, can't it? Right? So not only the person that's serving can undo it, but the spouse can sort of undo that. Because if you're a spouse, you know your spouse cares for you and you make point them back to the Lord, then you, you can kind of undo that, can't you? I want to show you here in 1 Timothy 5 how in church we ought to treat each other like family. And even in the Bible, um, you know, we, we see that the relationships amongst people within the church should be like family. 1 Timothy 5, rebuke not an elder, but him treat him as a father. Right? So the older men we should be treating as fathers. And the younger men as brethren, like our brothers. The older men, the older women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Why does it say with all purity? Right? Because you're meant to be treating the girls in church, boys, right? And, and any, any boys, we should be treating the girls in church like they're our sisters, right? And we, we care for our sisters, right? We care, I mean, we care about who they hang out with. We care about that. We don't want them to just get, you know, like in the Old Testament when Tamar was just taken and then Simeon and Levi got really upset, right? Saying, how can they treat our sister like a, like a whore, like a prostitute? But we ought to treat women like that too, where we don't treat them just like whores. We don't just like try and get what we can from them and all that sort of stuff, right? We need to treat our sisters with all purity. Now in Galatians 6, look at this. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Right. So this is talking about doing good things. But look at what it says here. As we therefore have opportunity, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the of the household of faith. So again, the Bible teaching here, and it's sort of reinforcing what Jesus is saying, right? Where he didn't hold his physical family in higher regard than his spiritual family, because his real family was the spiritual family. And even in Galatians 6 here, he's saying, hey, we want to do good unto all men. So I'm not saying neglect your physical family. That's not what I'm getting at here. He's like, you do what you can for your family. But what I'm telling you here is the Bible teaches us clearly that we, are ought, to, we ought to do good even more so to the household of faith to your brothers and sisters in Christ than even your physical blood relatives. Isn't that an interesting thing? So we see one was finances, right? Deuteronomy 20. Number two was family, these factors that affect your fight. Number three is fear uh, or a faint heart. We saw that in uh, Deuteronomy 20 verse 8. And the officers shall speak unto the people and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return unto his house lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Now, this, is, this one goes without explanation, right? That if you are fearful of getting in the fight, you know, what sort of warrior are you going to be? What sort of soldier are you going to be if you're scared to open your mouth boldly, make known the mystery of the gospel? Let's look at a few verses here just on this fear. And now, fear in and of itself is not necessarily bad because there's two types of fear, right? You either fear man or you fear God. Now, fearing God is a good thing. So when it talks about fear, it's fearing other men, right? Fearing what man can do unto you. So Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Now what is a snare? A snare is like a trap. A trap is something that immobilizes you, right? And that's what the fear of man does. It, it stops you from moving forward. It stops you from doing things you ought just because out of fear, right? They can't even do really that much to you. Uh, but you're just fearful because it's just something in your mind. It just traps you and stops you from doing something that you could do and that you're more than well capable of. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Psalm 118.6 The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man 
can do unto me. Uh, Luke 12, I like, uh, and this is in a couple of the different Gospels where it says, you know, don't fear God more than you fear man, and obviously in the context of salvation as well. But I love the way uh, it's put in Luke 12 in verse 4 here. It says, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And look at this, and after that, have no more that they can do to you, right? That mo no more that they can do. So the most they can do is kill you, right? They can send you to heaven, right? That's the most that they can do. Right? But verse 5 says, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath both power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now obviously that doesn't apply to us who are saved, right? Because we cannot go to hell. But the point I'm trying to make here is, how do you overcome a fear of man? Like to the unbeliever here, you know, they fear man. And he's saying, hey, no, no, you ought to fear God more than you fear man. So how do you overcome a fear of man? That you fear God even more than that. You know, you, we ought to fear as believers, like we talked about the chastisement in Hebrews, what God can do to us as his children. That fear ought to drive you and get you away from the fear of man. Uh, this is in Acts 5. We see the apostles here. And when they had brought, brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not straightly command you? So it's like plainly, right? Like for, straightforward. Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So why were they not fearful of what that council could do to them? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. See, they feared God more than they feared men. And that's why even when men straightly charged them, men, you know, they, they, they threatened them. It didn't stop them from preaching the gospel, opening their mouth boldly to the point where it says, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. I, I hope one day that's said about our church, where we just filled Punchbowl with the gospel. We filled Canterbury with the gospel. We filled Australia with the gospel that people would know about us because we are all opening our mouth boldly, making known the mystery of the gospel. Now, the link I wanted to show you here is this whole link between obeying God and fearing God. Because I talked about fear, right? We don't want to fear man. We want to fear God. What does it mean to fear God? Does it just mean you just tremble, you know, tremble in your boots and you don't want to do anything? No, no. Fearing God is when you fear him enough to obey him, right? And there's a very strong link in the Bible that the fear of the Lord is keeping his commandments. Let's have a look at these verses here. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me, and keep my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. See that link there between fear and keeping the commandments. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. Deuteronomy 8, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Deuteronomy 13, Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him, and look at this, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, excuse me, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. Psalm 111 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and look at this, now it says it the other way around, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments, his praise endureth forever. So isn't that interesting there? So you see the, the beginning of wisdom sort of lines up with a good understanding. So it's kind of flipped, right? Fear of the Lord, beginning of wisdom, good understanding, they that do his commandments. And then we talked about King Solomon, the conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now I just wanted to end on this point where... You know, we talked about the three factors. You know, we're at a war. We're in a spiritual war that's going on. You know, we've got finances that can affect your fight. Your family can affect your fight. Fear of man can affect your fight. Now, I just have this word here, quality, not quantity. Because what I found was really interesting, right, about Deuteronomy 20 is... If you remember the scene here in Deuteronomy 20, it says, When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou... Right, so the scenario is already that they're going up against an enemy, that, that it, there is more than them. Now, at that point, you probably have the mentality, like us all logically and physically would think, well, we need more, right? Like, if we want to win, then we need even more people. How are we going to win with less than them? But what's, what's God's method? God's method says, 
well, you know what? They are more than you, but I want you to tell the people that, you know, if they've got the vineyard, if they've got the house, if they've got a wife that they've betrothed and hasn't taken, if they're fearful, then go back home. So isn't that interesting that we logically would think, man, if we are less than our enemy, we need more people to fight. But God is actually at this point in this battle, he's, he's, he's trimming it down, right? He's qualifying the, 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 the soldiers and actually now less people are going to go out to fight. Why? Because it's not, the, it's not always the quantity of soldiers that are in the spiritual fight, right? It's the quality of the soldiers, right? And that's why we don't have to be some huge church. We don't have to be this huge group of people. If we just increase the quality of the people that we have now, we can win this fight. Why? Because God is on our side, right? And I, I, something I always find interesting about the Bible, I mean, look at this. I, I underline more than thou, and it's just a thought. I don't know if I'm 100% right on this, but it's just interesting that in the King James Bible, we have thee, thy, thou, which is singular you, right? Because you in the King James Bible is a plural. So if I said, you know, I say unto thee, and I'm talking to Elizabeth, even though you're seeing that written down, you know I'm talking to one person, right? But when I say I'm talking to ye, I'm talking to everybody. So it's just interesting that sometimes God, when he says like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's almost like even though the word is written to all believers, when you read it yourself, it's talking to you. It's saying thou, you know, it's you, right? The singular. Even here it says like this. It's more than thou. Be not afraid of them for the Lord thy God, right? The singular, the Lord your God, one person, is with thee. So it's almost like this, this soldier, right, is, is, is reading this and knowing that God is not just with us as, as, as a whole, which he is as well, but he's with you as an individual. You know, isn't that it's interesting? That I don't know why, if that's why the singular is there, but it's, it's always a thought I have whenever I see thou. It's like, man, it's God. It's like he's speaking directly to me. And it's, and see, but in verse 2 it says, And it shall be when ye are come nigh. So now it goes into the plural. Right? So that's why I don't know why, why it didn't always say, you know, more than you, be not afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you. It doesn't say that, right? So there's that, that distinction there between the singular and you, because God is with us. So why is it the quality of the soldier? We don't need these great numbers, the quality, because God is with us, right? It says here, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Why? But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honour and some to dishonour. Right? So in a house of God, he's saying some vessels are vessels to honour and some vessels are vessels to dishonour. Right? And he wants us to, everyone that nameth the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Why? Verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these... He shall be a vessel unto honour. And why do you want to be a vessel unto honour in the house of God? Sanctified and meet for the master's use. See, God is with us. God wants to use you. But if you do not depart from iniquity, you don't want to keep, you're not trying to keep the commandments of the Lord. You're not going to be meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. See, God wants to use you. It's, I always use the analogy. It's like you want to clean a table, right? But you don't go and get a dirty cloth to clean a table. You want to get a clean cloth to clean the table, to get the work done. You need to be suitable, suitable for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So that's why you're going to flee also youthful lusts, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see there, God doesn't need a lot. Right? God often used individuals in the Bible to get a great work done. He doesn't need quantity when he's the God of the universe. But what he wants to use is quality. He wants to use a believer that's meat, that's, 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 a, that's a vessel unto honour, that's meat for the master's use and prepared for every good work. So what's the conclusion, right? You want to purge yourself from these so you'll be a vessel meat for the master's use. So obviously I'm not saying... You know, and obviously you don't want to take the analogy of, um, you know, Deuteronomy 20 too far in the sense of, you know, I, you don't want to just say, well, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, family finances and fear is affecting me, so I'm just going to drop out of the fight. You know, that's not what I'm getting at, right? What I'm getting at is, you know, because all of us struggle in these areas. We all struggle with family, you know, with finances, with fear, trying to keep God first. But what you want to do, now that you know these three, effect, uh, these three factors, and, you know, just reminding of you of these tonight, these three factors that affect 
your fight, you need to acknowledge, you need to understand how they are affecting your fight, how they're affecting your church, how they're affecting your own effectiveness as a soldier. And you just don't want to be ignorant of the war that we're in and, and get in there. You know, get into the fight. Let's, let's do some great things for God. God doesn't need a lot, right? He just needs the quality, uh, not the quantity. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Thank you for the reminder in Deuteronomy 20 that, Lord, you're a, you're a God that's bigger than we could even imagine. And Lord, all we have to focus on uh, is not the quantity of people we have, Lord, but just the quality of each individual in this church. Lord, help us to be a vessel unto honour uh, that's uh, sanctified and, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Lord, help us to not be taken away by finances, our family, or fear of man. Help, help us, Lord, to fear you, keep your commandments. Help us to open our mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the, the gospel. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, helping us. We, help us. we thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, we're not perfect. Um, Lord, we don't want to quit the fight. So help us, Lord, to be a good soldier that's not entangled in the affairs of this life. And uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.